Bruce, maybe you could tell me how this show came together and what it took to get it here. Well, they started in the Vitra Design Museum in Weil am Rhein in Germany. And they were working for two years to get all the stuff from America together. And you must know, all the stuff from Frank Lloyd Wright is owned by the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation. And these people, they are very, very cautious about this stuff of Frank Lloyd Wright, of course. So it really took quite a while to convince them and to have a nice show together. And that Partly we were helped, or we were very much helped actually, by David G. DeLong in, from Philadelphia, who is a real expert on, on this field. So when he came in, it went a lot easier, of course. That was fun. And that will say we will have about here 150 drawings of the man, and a lot of pictures, of course, of his, of his houses, and a lot of models, and some of his ceramics, his uh, dinner services, and other kind of inside interior stuff which he made. But in the birds from Berlin in Amsterdam, it's a rather big building, so it was still too small. And uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, he was a man who had a lot of influence on the Dutch architecture, and especially on interior design. So we collected, apart from the Vitra Design Show, we collected a lot of Dutch furniture, which express all this influence of Frank Lloyd Wright on these Dutch Man. And they were quite famous in those days. I mean, Rietveld is still very well known, and Berlach himself is very well known. But you also have people like Alons and Dudok, who built a lot of things, buildings in Hilversum. Uh, Duiker, which in Holland are world famous, and for Holland are quite important. So the show is actually about, it gives a, an, an overview, a survey of all the work of Frank Lloyd Wright and of the influence he had on Dutch interior design. And altogether, well, I guess it will have, ta it have taken us three years <laughs> to have brought it all together. <laughs> now we're, we're, st we're standing here in the Berlacher building. Um, I know that he was very influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright. He went to America in 1911 yeah, and, right. uh, and came back and... Um, and introduced so him. He, uh, I mean, he was hardly known, Frank Lloyd Wright, in Holland. And when Berlach went to the United States, he even didn't know himself. So he was just pointed out by Sullivan to go and, have, and look to these buildings. Frank Lloyd Wright himself was in Europe in those days, so he never met him. And he saw it, and he came back, and he told everyone in Holland, this is the great, new, talented, most talented... What did he say? He's the most gifted building master of the United States. Well, everyone said, okay. But because Wright was in Europe in those days, he published a book in Europe, in Germany actually, the, the so-called Wasmut edition. And in this edition he published all his work. And this book went around in Holland and everyone watched to it, looked to the, to the pictures, and that really had an impact. And you can see that, that some of these Dutch uh, people, they just watched these pictures and they started to do it themselves. Uh, over there, somewhere uh, 50 meters behind us, there is an, uh, an, an house, a little small house from in Hilversum. And last few days ago, an American woman came in and she said, Mr. Bakker, I am an absolute adept of Frank Lloyd Wright, but could you tell me this house? I, I don't know this house. I didn't know he, he built it. No, of course not. That was built by Duiker, a Dutch architect. So there was a really very close connection. And Berlager was the guy who really introduced him and said, look, this is really someone you should uh, watch for. Berlager himself was not someone who really followed the things Frank Lloyd Wright uh, did, because he thought he was not European enough. But that, of course, was something very positive for all his Berlach's pupils. So, uh, so, so, so they watched very, very carefully. Well, I do know that when Berlacher built his first uh, office building in The Hague, 
he actually was very influenced by the Larkin building in Buffalo and that went and is studied. true. That's that of course that's absolutely true. And also you have some drawings here of bridges which are also very much uh, right like you might say. <laughs> you might say. But uh, but anyway he himself he didn't think that he was really something like follower, you know. Which is different for Wales and so. Frank Lloyd Wright of course has had uh, have had m many different aspects in his works, and so they all picked up something. I mean, Frank Lloyd Wright, one of the first things he did, of course, was that he said, look, we have to build in an, uh, how do you put it in English? You have to build it in an, in, uh, in an industrial way. You know, you don't do it uh, piece by piece, but you make concrete blocks, for instance, you prepare them, you give the decorations on beforehand, and then you bring them all to the building place, and then you make a house of it. I mean that's quite normal now but in those days that was quite a new thing. That was one thing which was very, uh, had a lot of appeal in, in Holland especially to Rietveld for instance. On the other hand Frank Lloyd Wright also designed a lot of buildings and furniture which were quite expressive. With a lot of forms, with a lot of, you know, it just arouses a feeling when you, when you look at this furniture. That was quite another aspect which also in Holland was very much approved of by the people of the so-called Amsterdam School. But that was another thing. And also around The Hague there were a lot of furniture designers who made this wonderful, beautiful furniture. I mean, when you see it all together you think, it's oh, that's my grandma's furniture. But when you put it one to another, then all of a sudden you see all little jewels of chairs, of tables, of desks, sideboards, whatever. And then, of course, Frank Lloyd Wright was very important because of his thoughts about the city. He was one of the first men, who, and one of the first important architects, who said a car, and we, we are talking about 1930s, the car will be so important that people will start living on one place, working on another place, going to school on a third place, having their free time on a fourth place, and so on and so on. And all these places have to be interconnected by, uh, by roads. I mean, all the suburbs and all the, what we call in Holland, the town states or the garden cities. He uh, prophesied that. And he, he made a big model also of it, and he, he published about it, and he wrote about it. And we have in this show, we have a very, very big model built, especially built for this show, called the Living City. In wherein you can see how he already said in those days that will be the case within a couple of years and actually that has been the case. He didn't foresee all the traffic jams of course. <laughs> he only saw the positive things. He, he was always very enthusiastic. He was a very... I mean I haven't never met him because he died in 1959 of course but if you just read or listen to all the stories about him he must have been a very very uh, yeah, great man. I mean very enthusiastic always, very optimistic. He loved cars, he loved motorbikes and he loved very big buildings too. He was really a genius. I mean, he, he said of himself, I am a genius. And ac actually, in this particular case, that was true. <laughs> now, in your show, what do you have that is f of Frank Lloyd Wright? What is really Frank Lloyd Wright? Well, that's the building just uh, uh, at the rear of me. This is the Price Building. And it's, so it's, an, it's an apartment tower, and our offices are uh, underneath. The building structure is, there is a one central pole of concrete and all the floors are yes, glued to this pole and you can compare it to a tree or to, uh, I don't know how you say it in English, but when you have a ship you have also something with sails on it. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. A mast, okay, oh, that's in the holiday. So it's a mast. So the, the structure is like a mast. Um, nowadays, that is very easily done. In those days, you really have to come up with that. I mean, you had just to figure out how you actually could build it. And Frank Lloyd Wright, he himself, he had only two years of education as a construction man. So that is not quite a long education. But nevertheless, during his whole lifetime, he always found out new technical solutions for problems which everyone said in those days, you can't solve that. I mean, another example of that is the Johnson Wax uh, building. The Johnson Wax, it's an office and it has a very, very big hall. 
and the, the, the ceiling of the hall is supported by very long, high concrete uh, pillars. These pillars start very small at the bases, go up, go up, go up, go up, and now I'm already at 15 meters high, and then it generally blooms out into a kind of flower. Well, of course, everyone said, look, Mr. Wright, it's very, very beautiful, but this can't be built. So he had to prove it. He built one such pillar in the open air, and then he put on it ten, much, ten times as much as would be the case when the whole building is built. And then, at the, when it was ten times more, then it suddenly collapsed. Well, and that was some... I mean, that is something great, that someone with two years of education just came up with this kind of, of ideas and he proved that it, it worked. So this building is in that respect a very, very uh, characteristic building of his way of, of working and also of his way of designing. Another thing might be, of course, the furniture he made. I mean, uh, he, for instance, built a hotel in Tokyo, the Imperial Hotel, and he did everything for that the dinner service, the tables, the chairs. We have one chair, of course, in, in, the, in the show. And they are very characteristic because they, are, they have six corners and they are very beautiful oak with leather. And they are very expressive in their feelings. The, the hotel itself, it, this is destroyed. It, uh, there's a famous story about that too, uh, on construction things. Uh, there was a big earthquake in Tokyo and the hotel uh, didn't collapse. Many, many buildings in Tokyo collapsed, but his hotel didn't collapse. So Frank Lloyd Wright, with his grandeur, he just said to everyone, look, whole Tokyo collapsed except my hotel, which is a little bit, uh, you know, too much. But and then, and then a few years later, it, there was a big fire and then it got completely away. That, that's a bit of pity. But the hotel was very, very famous. Uh, so, and one of the chairs which we have here is, you can, you can look at that. And you can also see the the concrete blocks which he used in that hotel, you know, with the prefabricated blocks with all the ornaments and so on. So that is quite a thing. So within uh, your show here, you've got many plans, yeah. uh, original there's plans. There's something very special about these, these, these drawings. Uh, the original drawings are all with the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation in their archives. And when you would expose them to light, they would just shrivel away with an a month, two months. You can't expose them so long to light. So what did they do? They put them all on facilimes. And we have these drawings on the real size on a facilime. And we have put a bulb behind it. So now it are light cases. Uh, which is very good because in the original drawings the colors already faded a bit of course. But now because the, the light is behind it, suddenly the colors come to light, comes alive again. So these 150 drawings, and they are, he could make drawings beautifully. I mean, the way he presented his buildings to his commissioners. The moment they saw this drawing, most of them said, yes, we want to have it, do it. Uh, and so we, we mostly have uh, these presentation drawings here, of course. Not so much technical thing, because that's too abstract, actually, for an exhibition. But uh, the presentation drawings, and they are, they are beautiful. Absolutely. Of course, there are a lot of pictures too. The, what has been the the real the real building, and about these these very uh, how do you say that seductive presentation uh, drawings. Every commissioner, everyone who gave a commission to Frank Lloyd Wright to build something, knew that the budget would be doubled or even tripled. And of course, everyone said to himself, "Look, this is not going to happen to me." But it happened all the time. And Frank Lloyd Wright, he was so per persuasive that he could just convince these people to spend two million dollars in instead of one million dollars, or even three instead of one, just to have built this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. And that was always his argument. He always said, look, it's going to be beautiful. <laughs> and he won. <laughs> I understand that he went quite over on the Johnson building, uh, but in that one he designed everything right down to the telephones. Didn't yes, he? that was all, that was that, that was what he did. And also for the Imperial Hotel, for instance, and for the Falling Water, he did everything. Uh, for the Larkin building too. That was quite normal in those days. I mean, most architects 
did everything. The furniture, uh, the carpets, the, even uh, like Berlage himself. I mean, Berlage for this building, he did everything. The, the, the stools, the, the telephones, the light bulbs. Well, not the bulbs, but the, the light cases where you put the bulb in. Uh, and all the, well, all, all the stuff. So that's, Van I did it very well. And he always had this idea about organic architecture. So everything had to glue together, had to have a, a harmony with it. So the interior had to fit the exterior, the exterior had to fit the surroundings, and the surroundings had to fit the other surroundings. So it always went on. And one of his main themes was that in European architecture, we had Le Corbusier, for instance, uh, they always built these white blocks. And you could see them from a kilometer ahead. There was a, there was a building over there. That was not what Frank Lloyd Wright really wanted. He wanted that his buildings just went into the landscape, that it was just one harmonious thing. So a lot of his buildings, you don't see them from two or three kilometers ahead. You have to go to them, you have to look, to watch, to search, and there it is, and then you have to search for the entrance, because also the entrance is just somewhere in the surroundings. And that was what he called organic, organic architecture. Like he also did with building it. I mean, uh, when he built something in the desert, he made a low building and he collected all kinds of stones, which he put into the concrete, just to have a connection. And when he, built it some, when he started building something in a city, then he made something very tall and, and gorgeous, like, for instance, the Kuchenheim Museum, which is a gorgeous building, and which is very obvious when you see it. But that, you, that is something you need when you're in a city. That are the surroundings of a city. In a desert, it's quite different. So all these desert houses, they're quite low and hidden. And then they have these prairie houses also, which he made for, uh, most in the, in the 1910s, 1920s. They, they are in the, in the hills. And also these very, very large buildings are, uh, are large, not high. They have these long, long lines just going with the landscape and surrounded by a lot of plants, always designed. This should be a plant over there, it should be a plant over there, and there, and there, and there. And he was very strict about that. Even it was that uh, when, when someone said, okay, build a house for me, then he said, okay, you have to sell all your historic stuff, by which he meant all the furniture. And it, the table has to stood there, and the bed has to stand there. And he was a very, very strong person in that. Although when he started talking about himself, he always praised democracy and that everyone, of course, should have his own thing. <laughs>